Welcome back to our um, sequestration and resiliency group. Uh, this is a very exciting topic and something that um, requires a lot of conversation. It's not an easy topic to wrap your hands around or to take action on. And so we're really thrilled um, to have you here to help focus in on the conversations. Um, First of all, for was everybody at our first um, meeting? I think there's a couple of faces that were not. So I just want to give you a real quick recap of some of the things that the city of Issaquah is doing to help touch on some of the um, sequestration items. Is you know like 20% of the city is currently open space, um, which really helps. Uh, Significantly with our sequestration and we do have a, a recent tree canopy study indicated that the city has a 51% tree canopy coverage, which is a leading uh, percent coverage uh, compared to other cities in the region. Um, you know, our trees provide cooling wildlife help with stormwater management and obviously the carbon sequestration. We've also been working with uh, city forest credits and hope to pilot a carbon uh, credit program. This year we're working with Mountains of Sound Greenway. I'm trying to plant 10,000 trees within our forest system uh, to help on that and that these credits will help offset local companies uh, with their emissions. And also we're working with um, on the Green Essequa Partnership, which is a partnership between Forterra, the city and community members to really uh, start stewarding and volunteering uh, to help maintain and restore our forested areas. And uh, we've also worked with King County and the Trust for Public Land and other community groups to uh, preserve uh, 46 acres on Cougar Mountain from being developed um, and save that natural forest uh, for future um, future benefit and community values. Um, also, as far as resiliency, we're working on our stormwater and surface water master plan update right now. Um, climate impacts and what it means for flooding will also be addressed um, in that, as well as we've had some preliminary conversations with our east side fire and rescue regarding firewise programs in order to reduce our threat. So that's kind of where the city is right now um, and some of the things we are doing where we still have a long ways to go, but this is uh, what we've been working on. But in addition to that, I want to pose the first question in the chat for everybody. Um, what <laughs> you get my little note there too. Uh, what are two or three most important concerns related to this topic for Issaquah and why regarding resiliency and sequestration? Um, what have been the predictions? Oh, hang on. I think I have everybody yeah, muted. Hold on, let me unmute. Sorry. Okay. Uh, do we have uh, predictions for like temperature rise or rainfall increase? You know, I'm not sure what current level of inventory data we have and what um, some of our goals are for some of that, but that would definitely be. Yeah. You know, a topic of concern. Of that we have, that we have, you know, a topic of concern. Um, that we want to for some that. of that, but that would definitely be. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, we are getting some feedback. So, if you want to make a comment, just put comment in the box, and I'll call your name, and we'll uh, have you add in. Does anyone want to? And Matthew. Oops, hold on. There you go. Okay, I'm gonna put this in two different categories. One, because I deal with that resiliency. And we, when we look at our force and we look at it, we, we want them to bounce back. We don't want them just to be, you know, something that just goes away, right? So definitely with the resiliency side of it, definitely look on a wildfire because that's where my specialty is, is looking at creating these defensible spaces that have ecology in effect. And it's what I do. Um, so when you, and kind of, I'm going to feed into carbon sequestration. I bounce all over the place a lot because my brain just bounces. Is it's I'm great to hear that you're all planting more trees, but I think what we need to do is make sure we're planting the right trees in the right place. 
and we need to make sure that we're managing the trees that we put in. Planting them is great, but then there's going to be a cost for that long-term management to make sure that they keep on taking that carbon we want. With that long-term management, we come back to creating a more resilient forest and a more resilient landscape. And that's, I think, really where we need to focus. Did it, was that too scattered? Does everybody get what I'm trying to say? We gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. And let's see, I see Dan, you've got um, a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll <clears throat> once again advocate really strongly for the aquatic resources in the city here. You know, we sit at the bottom of a 60 square mile basin. It is a, you know, tier one uh, stream for salmon recovery in, in our watershed, our broader watershed. Um, I mean, the city itself, like I said, I mean, it is historically large, large swaths of wetland, which have, have unfortunately been lost over the last 150 years, and we're slowly, slowly, you know, trying to gain some of that back. So I think, you know, the aquatic resources tie really directly into what Matthew was talking about. Those are our forest resources, our upland habitats, our riparian habitats as well, of course. Um, it ties into stormwater use, it ties into development. I mean, they're all very, very interconnected. Um, but to me, you know, that is that is really, you know, in in looking at climate resilience, resiliency and resilient habitats, and also all the other things we're talking about being trail cities, recreation, all that sort of stuff. You know, it, it all starts with with the water and the basin we're we're sitting in here, pretty much all of today. So, great, thank you for that, Dan. Danny, I see you had a comment too. Yeah, um, this is more like trying to about my concerns. I you know they, they mentioned in like the first part that this is the part that they kind of focused on the least um, funding wise resiliency. We haven't really spent that much into investing in um, just making sure that our city will uh, be able to sustain through all of the impacts that we'll see from climate change. Um, and then I think one of my concerns with that is, is with the funding, because I think Anne mentioned um, in the big group just a couple minutes ago how we are really relying on sales tax and all of that and i think maybe mark can speak to this too um because our city budget is so um scarce and especially with covid um the the, the rent um thing is a big concern of mine it's it's a big problem um i think especially in our city because we do have so many renters so um yeah i think that might be something interesting to think about or to talk about um how we plan to fund all of our these things that's a great point. Thank you, Danny. And I see there's some kind of a side comment about planting some trees for warmer weather. Um, just let's touch on that real quick. We're supposed to be back in our other meeting at 1.15, so I want to make sure we leave enough time to get to our other questions. Um, so can we leave that in the chat for the moment and then hop into the other question? Is there anyone else that has a comment about the, the first question here that they would like to add? What are um, two or three most important issues? Mark, let me unmute you here. Oops. I just did it myself. Go. So we, we, oh, okay. we, we counteracted each other. <laughs> um, so this, I should know the answer to this, but Jennifer, has the city quantified the carbon that's stored in its existing trees and forests? No, we have not. So there is a new protocol out there now that's designed to help cities quantify the carbon. And that may be a surprising amount of carbon that you're sequestering in those trees. And the reason that could be important is when the city sees, I mean, if the city is setting its own, it's quantifying its own emissions, it may set its own emission reduction goals. Then if it can see the contribution made by the forest, it may be more inclined to put some money into managing, planting, preserving. And the managing, as Dan knows, and, and Matthew, that's a complicated issue. There are many different ways to manage a forest to keep it healthy. But healthy forests generally have more biomass and they have generally have more carbon. So having that, having that quantification might help the city you know, generate more funding. Because I, th I think the real problem with the cities is that at the end of the year, the trees are just an expense. So they're just a cost. And in a, in a private business, you'd also have a balance sheet that keeps track of your assets. So 
if somehow the city could include in its accounting metric the trees as an asset, then you have an expense, okay, but you also have the asset value of it. So then you're capturing both sides of that. Because with every infrastructure, whether it's hard gray infrastructure or green, there's going to be expenses. Mm -hmm. but, but we know the asset value of all the gray infrastructure. We know how much a plant costs and how it's treated on the books. We, we don't do that with trees. So it, Issaquah could be a leader if it said, we're going to take into account the asset value of our trees, not just the cost annually to maintain it. That's a brilliant idea. Thank you for sharing that. And certainly something that would be worth uh, having future conversations regarding. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see, let's hop into question number two here. Uh, what kind of things could be done to overcome potential barriers and make progress on this topic? I think Mark kind of opened that up a little bit uh, with his prior comment. Anyone else have some thoughts on that? You just want to delete our uh, mute, unmute ourselves, Jennifer. You you can, or I can do it either way. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. I kind of want to elaborate on what Mark was actually hinting to, because you were literally sitting on an asset when you look at timber. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at trees, they will grow to a certain life expectancy. Everything has a life expectancy. It will grow to a certain point where it only takes in enough carbon to survive. Okay, that asset then turns into more cost, and if and this is where and this is going to sound pretty bad so don't you know harvesting may be the right thing to do to recoup some of that money but i i strongly suggest about using old practices when it comes to harvesting there's ways of harvesting a forest where you minimize impact to the soils and you also minimize the detriment to a wildlife ecology and still maintain that beautiful healthy force we want to do and so using new practices to do that is i think the best way to recoup some of the money that you have put into that force to make sure it's resilient very much leia selective thinning that's all what, I got about, there. what about other behavior changes or things we do what about storm water as part of this um as part of a resiliency factor. Dan? I mean, this this might, this is a big, broad, costly, I should say, idea. But I mean, we talked about, um, we've talked about retrofitting buildings for energy. I mean, retrofitting buildings for stormwater too. I mean, I think something that we shouldn't be, you know, um, factoring out of the equation here. So knowing, knowing some of the stuff, like I said, especially in the lower parts of the basin where it's really a struggle, you know, the Costco area specifically, um, you know, I, I think that's something we should absolutely be considering, knowing that there, you know, theoretically, it's going to be a lot of development on an area with light rail coming here in the next, you know, couple decades. So um, I would I would advocate for that, at least thinking about that conceptually. Great. Thank you for that, Dan. Mark, I see you had a comment as well. Um, well, yes, I, I th uh, when I think of resiliency, I think of things like stormwater flooding. I think of air quality. I think of heat and, you know, urban heat that's just clearly getting worse all over the world. And then I think about vulnerable populations or, you know, that can be equity also. And then I think there are lots of things you can do in each one of those. So with stormwater, if there's mapping, so that you see where the floodplains are and there probably is. And if you can see where the big impervious surfaces are that are producing a lot of runoff, Air quality, you know, sometimes um, there are schools located near high traffic roads. And if you selectively plant trees in between those, that can have a huge uh, health effect on, on like young school age kids. Uh, same with heat. I don't know if there's mapping on where there are gaps in a tree canopy so that the city could fill those gaps to really cool off the hot air. Um, some cities, like in the Central Valley, California, they have ordinances requiring people to plant trees in parking lots because parking lot is just uh, heat, you know, it just collects and radiates the heat. And then, of course, the vulnerable population, 
that's a whole nother issue. You know, where are they? How do we protect them? In what ways? Those are all resiliency issues, but they're complicated because they require some mapping, some analysis, and then you have to select which ones are we going to focus on, and then what do we do? One thing that came out of our tree canopy study was um, single family homeowners actually had a significant increase in their tree canopy coverage as part of this. So also educating individual homeowners as far as their individual role, you know, it's sometimes overwhelming to think of that, you know, planting a tree to protect shade a driveway, right? But even at a homeowner level that can be managed um, and educated to help with that heat island effect and to help um, manage that, but it's really, you know, there's here comes that education piece as well, right? What are the different roles of sequestration and um, resiliency, even as a homeowner or as a business owner, you know, and uh, how can we spread that education out? Any other ideas on this topic? Can I piggyback on that really quickly, Jennifer? Yes, that's, that's great. I would just like to acknowledge, I mean, City of Seattle has a phenomenal street tree program through their public utilities. And, you know, once again, it's it's not the most insanely costly thing in the world. I mean, you're still, you know, talking money, of course, but it's, uh, you know, something that could be a model that we can, you know, consider looking at that seems pretty tangible. Um, great, thank you. Oh, Matthew? I, and I want to make sure that there it's known when, especially around wildfire, because you talk about trees, you think you, know, you got to be bare and you got to be things like that. When it comes to trees, plant them. But it's about where you plant them and how and what, how, what's their growth rate? How close are they going to be to the home? You can still have trees. You just need to plant them in the right place. And I kind of want to hint on something that Dan had talked about earlier is about non-point pollution. You know, reducing your, you know, cars coming into Issaquah, reducing those, you know, will reduce your non-point pollution would, would help your hydrology within that area too, so. Any other big barriers you think we need to try and address before we move on to the next question? I would just, I would just echo that it's a way to frame it, maybe less of a barrier as an opportunity, as Mark was saying, to better, you know, quantify or, you know, put, put dollar amounts or like, so the education is great to just kind of know the ecological benefits, but if we can start to quantify and look at these things as assets, I mean, I, I love the way you explained that. And I think that's an opportunity, not a barrier. But. I would agree. I, I think one, one barrier, at least on some of the management of our forest lands, the city's bureaucracy and insurance requirements and some of that gets in the way. Um, BNR is a lot easier to work with, with volunteers and get people out. And, um, um, and of course, they, they've got a huge area and they don't have that many people, so <laughs> they need us more. But, um, and they sometimes don't know what we're doing. But um, I think um, the city needs to help see how we can work with the volunteers um, in a more regular basis and um, not have to be so locked in you know, the insurance and liability things or whatever we have to do to, to make citizens more involved. Hey, David, we're getting a little feedback from you. I, I, it also looks like you might have joined us twice. Um, uh, I'm not sure. It could, I could be on six times. I, I was having all kinds of <laughs> <and stuff. laughs> um, Okay, well, just know to speak slowly because we are getting a little feedback from okay. you. All right. Um, I'm going to move us on to question three. We need to be out of here at 115, and then we can open it up for any other uh, food for thought that we may want to talk about after question three. If we came back in a year, what might you like to see that would indicate things are starting to move in the right direction? I think Mark kind of hit on it earlier to really see, you know, get that that assessment of how much you all are actually sequestering carbon. Uh, I think that would give us more data and be able to kind of see where you're going. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Matthew. Anyone else?
No one has any ideas. Oh, Dan. I can just, I mean, yeah, for me, I think it's, yeah, the, the opportunity we've all hammered it. Mark, we're just running with your, your ideas here, but um, quantification of assets. Um, I mean, documented, you know, we should set goals on educational opportunities. What do those look like over the next year? What's, what's tangible, you know, especially looking in a pandemic right now. And then, you know, along those same lines as, you know, just continuing to find ways to increase um, you know, volunteer led stewardship on the ground efforts, because as much as we want to keep advocating that something is an organization we struggle with, we love our volunteer engagement, but we also don't want it to fall as a substitute for not funding the work at the level it probably should be on the agency level. Um, so it's kind of a catch 22 because the engagement, the stewardship is so important, you know, to get the work done and, and for the education. But like I said, we still want to make sure we you know, probably fund this work and our agencies have the money to do that. But that being said, I mean, there's such a huge opportunity to do a lot of the, a lot of the long-term maintenance, um, you know, for the restoration and, you know, trail and other connectivity uh, stuff we're talking about at, at the volunteer level. So um, mm -hmm. I think that volunteer engagement, education, and then you know, just kind of better assessment of resources. And then, you know, maybe with that information, you can you know, kind of prioritize where to go from there. Um, Great. Yeah, Mark. Um, I, I just, so I, I'm kind of an old dude um, and we have like <laughs> Danny on the call who is the next generation. And so I think being an old dude, I tend to think in terms of, okay, how do we approach this like strategically? How do we get the facts? How do we develop a plan? How do we execute the plan? But what one one of the wonderful things that the younger generation has brought is a sense of passion and a sense of almost like a movement and they're so it's going to take all of us to do that right i mean it's going to take the old dudes who are going to try and do the planning and make the city change as a county metric or whatever we want to call it it's going to take matthew and dan who are on the ground like planning maintaining doing that i think it's going to take movement building too and someone like Danny and the younger generation, that's the passion and the energy that I see coming from, from, from her. So I guess I would ask my fellow, whatever we are here, uh, participant, Danny, what, what do you think? <laughs> well, and two, Mark, one question I had for you um, as part of this is, I know you are very involved with trees at a, uh, not only a regional level, but a national level and what's happening in other cities. Is there, is, are there things that are occurring in other cities that may be good ideas for us to glean from? You know, this isn't a topic that we need to reinvent the wheel. Are there programs, actions, movements, things other cities are doing? Well, I, I think Danny was trying to say something, not, not to interrupt oh, you. Oh, sorry. Danny, are you muted or were you muted? Jared. Yeah. Um, well, I was just gonna. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's um, okay. I was gonna comment on what you were saying about the passion. I think that's very true, in the sense that, um, especially in my generation, I feel like people um, really want to get out there and make the necessary change, and they have a lot of drive and a lot of passion. Um, and I think you're right in the sense that it's gonna take a lot of coming together. Um, because um, something that I find frustrating, at least like in my own personal life, is that there's a lot I want to do, but there it's kind of hard to figure out um, what you can do, especially when you're tackling such a giant issue like climate change. It's um, you know feeling like what can you do as an individual that will actually make kind of different, um, which is one of my personal frustrations. I think it's kind of hard out there and, and make the necessary change. So, yeah, I think that's something that maybe we can think about is how do we provide our community, not only kids that are my generation, but even other people to get together and make um, actual change in the community. That's an excellent point, Danny. It is daunting to think of trying to move this needle alone. And how do we, how do we band together to help make little change to make significant difference, right? And how can we do it together? Because um, we can't do it alone. We need each other um, and support to, to make this happen. So, great point. 
Any other thoughts anyone would like to share? I guess one, one, back to one thing is getting people on the ground. Uh, Dan, I don't know what your gift, repeat people you get for all your work parties and all of that, but we started the Trails Club for over 40 years ago. We had less than 50 acres of park on Cougar Mountain. We got well over 3,000 acres now. And our whole pitch was getting people out and hiking and seeing the ground and building up an advocacy. I think we can get people out dealing with high V, dealing with invasives and these other kinds of things. We can build a constituency that will be telling the city that this is important, the state, the county, that this is important and we need support for it. And I think that's the key is getting people out and seeing it feel like they're doing something positive to help out and mm -hmm. see others doing that. And they build some feeling that they can make a difference, which most people in our world and right now don't feel they can. Yeah, and that's Dave, just to add in on that a little bit, you know, uh, we're working with uh, Forterra and building our green uh, Issaquah program and a forest steward program to just do that, help empower and train forest stewards to go out, deal with invasives, remove them, identify them, um, replant, restore those forest lands, and then also help manage and maintain them. So those new plantings can grow and succeed uh, to help make a healthy forest. So um, hopefully this fall, we can get that program up and running. Uh, COVID is kind of, again, thrown in a, <laughs> a kink with that. Um, but uh, yes, you know, that's right up the alley where Dave was talking about. Mark, what, um, just real quick while you have the group here, what about anything happening at a, you see throughout other cities or in the region uh, that would be really important for us to know regarding this topic? Boy, you know, <clears throat> there are as many things happening as there are cities. I mean, cause they're all doing different things. Um, probably on the advanced wave, you have places like Austin, Texas, where um, they're just they're just active on all fronts that you can imagine, and a lot of that is the city set its own carbon reduction goal, so it set it set goals that it had to meet, and it had to drive that through every every division in the city. So they're they're highly motivated to do everything, and for example, they've been very interested in our carbon credit program because they are now buying carbon credits, but they're buying them from like landfills and forests that are thousand miles away from all. So they really want local, locally sourced carbon credits where the, so the benefits are local and then the taxpayer dollars stay local. So they're, they just think about all that stuff ahead. Another, another city that's just adopted a very aggressive climate plan is Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's a smaller town. It's a university town. You know, it's fairly affluent town. It's got the University of Michigan there, which is a important and you know well-funded organization. Um, but they're doing all. They're just they're doing all manner of things, from you know forest stuff to energy to transit to food to waste. Um, it's it's really through all those different sectors, and a lot of it starts with the assessments almost like setting baselines, like where are we? So how do we measure our progress? And then it's setting targets on, on all those different things that affect climate action, basically. Well, great. Well, thank you for that. Yes. Thank you all very much for this focused conversation. I know this is probably the first of many future meetings we will have um, on this topic. Um, in the future and look forward to your continued involvement. I'm gonna post the um, link back to the main meeting room. We'll do another report out, uh, Lindsay, and then uh, Megan will introduce us to what our next steps are and where we're gonna go from here. So I look forward to seeing y'all in the next room.